The price of gold has risen dramatically from about $250 per ounce in 2000 to over $1,600 in 2012. This has stimulated a new worldwide gold rush. But the panning of large gold nuggets you've seen in the past is all gone. Today, gold is either trapped in hard rock that needs to be crushed to a fine powder to be released, or it's part of a geologically decayed rock layer found in sediment. Either way, artisanal and small-scale gold miners are using liquid mercury to extract the tiny granules of gold. In this presentation, I'll review the mercury gold amalgamation process by describing the mining communities in Bolivia and Peru. However, the processes are similar throughout the world. It all starts with digging gold-containing rocks out of the ground. Usually in this region of the world, the gold is found in quartz-containing rock. The rock has to be crushed to release the small gold particles. This is done using a rotating ball mill. Water is added to help the process. The crushed rock with lots of water goes into a cascading and vibrating set of screens called a sluice, whereby water is slowed and the heavy gold particles settle and get trapped in the carpet-like padding. Gold is much heavier than rock, sand, and even lead, so it will fall out and get trapped in these screens. But at the end, you have a mixture of sand and gold particles that's called the concentrate. The gold particles are often the size of flour and may not be visible to the naked eye. Metallic mercury is added to this muddy mixture. Mercury physically reacts with gold, forming an amalgam. If you have a silver tooth filling in your mouth, you're aware of this. Dentists mix silver and mercury to form an amalgam to fill a cavity. Ultimately, the amalgam strengthens and it protects your tooth. To get the mercury to bond to the gold particles requires physical pressure and lots of surface contact. Here you see a stone used to do this. To the right of the stone, the concentrated gold ore is placed with water and mercury. The stone is rotated into place and the amalgamation begins. The worker rocks away and away and away, sometimes for hours. And in this community, it's a family event with music blaring to pass the time. Keep in mind that each amalgamator contains large amounts of liquid mercury, so all that splashing is contaminating the area with mercury. Afterwards, the material must be removed. Water, spent concentrate, and liquid mercury are all collected. It's an arduous process with plenty of mercury exposure. Once all the mercury is collected, it's squeezed so only the amalgam remains. All that silvery mercury you see here will produce about 2 grams of pure gold. At about 40 US per gram, that's $80 for this batch of concentrate. But what about all that wastewater and material? Well, the solids still contain particles of gold. I've tested the material and it does contain significant amounts of mercury also. This group of miners collect the waste sludge or tailings and sell them for further processing. Large formal gold smelters use a cyanide process to recover the gold. But many miners don't bother and let it flow into rivers where another group gets a chance at recovering residual gold from the waste. This liquid waste stream also contains mercury. Not all amalgamation is mechanical though. Very large numbers of people use their hands to rub the mercury and concentrate together. Many people downstream reprocess the waste material hoping to recover more gold, and they do. This group is called artisanal or subsistence miners. Unfortunately, children at a very young age are taught how to mine for gold using mercury. This practice occurs worldwide. At the end, this is what you get. About half of this soft mass is pure gold. That's a lot of money. So how do you further purify the amalgam? Well, you have to remove the mercury. This is done by heating the amalgam 
which in turn evaporates the mercury. A torch is used and it takes only a few minutes. And there you have it, gold door, or what is sometimes called sponge gold because it's rather porous. This is not 100% pure gold, but close enough. It must undergo further processing elsewhere. Obviously, while you're burning the mercury off, exposures occur. To prevent this, some conscientious miners use a retort. Here's how it works. You open the top of the retort, then place the mercury gold amalgam inside. See the small nugget? Then seal the entire device. An external heat source is applied, which melts, then evaporates the mercury. But this time, the gaseous mercury is channeled through an exhaust pipe, that long stainless steel tube you see, which releases the vapor underwater. That bright yellow instrument you see at the bottom left is monitoring mercury emissions. The cold water immediately condenses the mercury back into liquid form. You can see the small mercury droplets at the bottom of the pan. When things cool down, a worker opens the retort and there it is. This small piece of gold provides a fair amount of money for a family. The gold door is taken to the local Compro de Oro shop or the gold shop. These small discreet shops are abundant in gold mining villages and service the mining community. The shop will reprocess the gold door and ensure that all the mercury has been removed. After all, it's gold they want, not mercury, so they want to make sure all the mercury is out. Each gold shop has a furnace that's used for this purpose. There are all sorts of types, but very few have mercury capture devices attached. So again, mercury vapors are released, and this time in the community. The shops also process the mercury gold amalgam if the miner wants. In short, they service the complete artisanal mining industry. And as you can see, they even sell liquid mercury. Gold mining using mercury amalgamation is not unique to South America. It's widespread in Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. There have been many efforts to ban mercury and outlaw this form of gold mining. But given gold's commercial and industrial importance, and its high price, this form of gold mining is more prevalent than ever before, and will continue to be so. However, there are ways of reducing exposure and minimizing health effects, and many groups and universities are actively involved in addressing this serious environmental and occupational health risk. Hopefully, solutions can be found that allow people to continue mining gold and provide food for their families, yet not place themselves and the environment at risk. Thanks for listening.